You just press play on the Last Breath Hunt cast, home of the Huntroversy. We're here to entertain, educate, and engage. And in case you didn't know, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. Don't waste it. Today we're talking about not just calling, but aggressively calling using deer vocalizations and rattling with Matt and Jesse. The Whitetail Legacy podcast, which is um, coming in your ear holes, as Cody and Ryan say, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Matt and Jesse are here today. Say hello, boys, so that way they know what your voice sounds like. Matt, go ahead. How you doing? <laughs> Short and sweet. Perfect. Jesse, boy. How you doing? Also, how you doing? Tag team, one, two, duo. <laughs> hey, put that mic closer to your face a little bit. The I don't want to deep throat this The microphone. people are going to want to hear what's about to come out of both of your mouths, so just do it. Okay, bud? All right, it's there. It's there, and it's ready. Otherwise, you I'm going to stay lean back so you, they can see your glorious otherwise, beard on the podcast. Oh, uh, uh, yep. It is a glorious beard. For those guys on, watching it on YouTube. And it is a glorious day because we're talking about today calling tactics specifically with you guys. I counted the other day. So in the last seven years combined between the two of you, by calling, you guys have whacked 11 bucks. So that's Isn't a... That many? Jesus. That's a shitload of bucks. <laughs> and, uh, wow. so I would say that uh, the success level between you two is significantly above average. So let's go ahead and dive into the number one favorite call that you guys have in your arsenal. Jesse, what is your number one favorite way to call whitetails and why is that way? And then we'll go same question to you next. Uh, my, my favorite way to call whitetails is to rattle. Why? Because it seems to be the most effective way. And, um, we have really good success at it with just not necessarily beating the horns together, but tactfully rattling mm -hmm. in deer. There is a I like how you said tactfully on that. There is a certain sequence you need to do to make it realistic. Cause you'll see a lot of places and a lot of, you know, guys out there just hammering the piss beating out of the horns them. together. And a deer to me doesn't just go when they're rattling, when they're fighting, Yeah, you're going to have pauses you're gonna have tines tick tines click 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 you're not just gonna be bang 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 mm -hmm. bang it, it's it's just not not realistic if you're trying to call in a a, a smart deer a mature deer and i think one of the reasons that people caliber. try to do that too is you know and I, I think we're all guilty to a point of doing this like the very beginning of my rattling sequence i'll beat them together hard mm -hmm. so that get, the, get i the know that the noise yeah there. I'm get, I know I'm getting a noise out Caring there. So I well. think that's some of the reason why people do that. But mm -hmm. Matt, would you say your favorite call also is rattling? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I I used to have probably the most deadly set of horns on the face of the earth until I ran them over with my truck a couple years ago. And <laughs> After rattling in a buck? After killing Stan. <laughs> I rattled Stan in and killed him and uh, left him sitting in the grass and busted one of the whole antlers off of my set and i still have one of them and i'm a big fan of oddball sides too like i don't want to rattle with an eight point set i want to do a a five point side without a brow and a four point side or you know different different amount of tines so it, it i don't know it's just just a personal preference i guess definitely no brow tines though yeah no brow, brow tines are deadly the brow tines on like the third or fourth all day sit you're pulling in you're bloody bound knuckles to whack your mm -hmm. thumb i feel like or Every some time. kind of knuckle and busted wide open so for rattling rattling is both of your favorite calling sequences mm -hmm. so we've said you or know a verbal snort wheeze for jesse it's because of all the past experiences that he's had and all his success why is rattling your favorite call oh i mean i don't know it it's it's a big it's a big attention getter and I feel like sometimes because we had it we had a situation last year where we were hunting a four year old buck named Rob and before we even started rattling I did a vocalization of a snort wheeze just with my mouth mm -hmm. and it, it geeked that deer out of his skin. <laughs> he, yeah, I feel like sometimes a snort wheeze, if you do it in the wrong context, is a lot more aggressive than you say, say lightly sparring with your antlers or even just even just smacking them around a little bit for, yep. you know, 15 to 60 seconds. And I, I don't know, like I said, it, it geeked that deer out of his skin. And that's not the first time that's happened to us, even out of that same tree potential. Just like yep. a couple of years before, same thing happened. We snort weeds and rattled and he was boogered clear out of his skin. 
So I feel like rattling or light grunting is probably going to be a more uh, passive approach, if you can want to call it passive. I mean, rattling in itself is aggressive, but... I think rattling and grunting are kind of like the yelp of turkey hunting, right? Yeah. If you know how to yelp, you can probably call in and kill a turkey. And I feel like if you've got a smart rattling sequence and a buck's within earshot and the scenario makes sense for him or a grunt, I think that those are the top two, you know, most useful mm-hmm. calls, I would say, that yeah. can usually, be deployed. <clears throat> usually you want to work your way in. You just don't want to start beating the horns. Usually you'll throw you set, out... you got to build the scene. You'll throw out like a light grunt, you know, kind of like a, hey, I'm over here. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, you get your light rattle, you're like, or you look, you kind of like, what's up? And then you get the hard, you're like, all right, I'm ready to roll. So you don't want to like jump right in, like, ready to roll type Mm -hmm. thing. You want to like work your way into it. One one thing thing we do, we, we, if we have branches nearby, we'll simulate a buck using a licking branch. You know, that's a territorial display in most cases. You know, he's working a scrape, you know, catching the other attention. Yeah. Or rubbing a tree, scratching the tines on the bark of your tree you're sitting in. You know, that's just kind of setting the tone is what I'd call it. And a lot of times you'll kind of see that kind of uh, behavior on a deer, like right before they, you know, do fight. is like, well, like, you know, kind of like, hey, this is my territory, but don't come in here. You know, kind of trying to show aggression and, and dominance. And then that's when they do fight. So if you could kind of you know, do do the raking Make of the tree as or... Possible or some leaves or whatever makes some noise with you can tell the antlers then it's, you know i feel just like it paints just adds more that, of a picture yeah extra element of realism too for sure because you know when you guys have seen bucks fight before and so have we and it certainly isn't quiet the forest is not like completely no. dead calm despite the clickety clack of antlers like there are you know if they're fighting in the woods there's leaves getting rustled there are often times when you know garrett and i'll call in a buck and we'll call in a lone single buck and he just doesn't know where the noise came from. Mm-hmm. He'll come in and make, you know, one of those small challenge scrapes in the middle of the yep. woods or to show his dominance, like you sure. guys were saying. So there's other auxiliary noises that are happening other than just the rattling of antlers, which I feel like is smart that you guys mentioned. Cause I mean, think about the interstate 10 yeah. buck you guys killed three years ago. Um, yep. it was the GoPro footage of that is awesome. You guys scraping are the, scraping yeah. the ground, rough on the grass, scraping making, the ground. Cause that's, I feel like that's one thing that you're lacking in a tree stand. You don't have the ability to rustle the leaves. You don't have the ability to make it sound total that's chaotic fair. on the ground. They're literally just going off your audio of your antlers. I mean, <laughs> yep. if you've got a deer halfway close, he's going to more than likely be a little bit leery of coming to that call that's, because he can't hear the chaos. I think that's a lot of the reason why if we are, when we do hunt on the ground, which you know is, Often. often often that's why we are so effective on calling deer because it's more natural you're you know a deer isn't stupid they know when the sound doesn't sound correct so mm-hmm. like when you're on the ground it's you know your ground level that's usually where i mean 100 percent of the time that's where deer is yeah. you can make that you know leaves grass kicking kicking stuff branches Rusted sticks it just 100 more and we natural. do the same thing with turkeys too you get a tom that's kind of hung up over a ridge you'll scratch the leaves scratch a little leaves, bit yeah. bust a stick that worked for us on public this spring, calling that bird up the hill. Booyah. Yes, it did. Um, so now we talked about that your favorite calling is rattling and some of the reasons. We're going to get into the actual sequence in just a little bit. Um, but I want to talk about rattling scenarios. So, Matt, we'll kick this one over to you first. What are you looking for when you are going to either blind rattle or sight rattle at a buck? Well, if I'm going to sight rattle a little buck, I'm going to go over this one first. Um, There's a lot of factors. I'm not going to sight rattle at a buck if he's in a wide open pasture and he can see all the way to me. If there's no, if there's no brush blocking up his line of sight, I'm not going to do that. I've got to have some kind of, some kind of cover in between him and I, where he cannot see directly below me, where, where there's, where there could be a deer hiding you know, we've, we've, I've seen it and I know a lot of people do it and they'll sight call it a deer and I've seen it on TV and he can literally see right to, right at the bottom of your tree. He can see everything. Yep. You'll see guys, gr- you'll see guys grunting at a deer that's within inside a hundred yards of him in the wide open. And he's not stupid. He knows there's not a deer over there. He can see that there's not a deer over there. So there are certain situations and time frames where sight calling at a deer, you know, like the interstate 10 going back to him. Mm-hmm. We saw him go in the timber. His line of sight was, was broken. Was broken. Yeah. He couldn't see. He didn't know what the hell was going on down there. So naturally, I picked him up and clacked him together again. I've done it 
shoot, I don't know how many times I've sight called. I've sight called just as much as I blind called. We'll say that. Blind calling is a little bit different for me. You know, the weather conditions have to be right. I don't like to blind call when there's absolutely no wind. There has to be a little bit of a little bit of cover noise to kind of not make a like a deer be all boogered and shit. They can hear them from six hundred yards away. Mm-hmm. You know that deer might be more apt to come, and then you're blind rattling on a deer that's two hundred yards away. Sure, if there's no wind or there's a lot of features like that, you know, you got to have some kind of background noise to cover up because it just wouldn't sound realistic because they can hear all that shit. That, to me, that's I don't know. It's just, it's a it's a flaky subject. Blind it, it is a flaky subject you're right that's a good way to put it uh jesse what about you when you're actually looking to um call in a buck whether or not you see him or don't what are the scenarios that you're looking for in which you're breaking out the antlers obviously you're taking into consideration time most of, of the time time of year right you know we've we haven't mentioned that yet but what else what other things are you looking for so like uh let's just go back to site calling and then i'll go to blind calling site calling uh, you have to be able to like know deer well enough to read their bl- to body language. Like, uh, you know, like if you don't, if you know, you can tell that there's a buck that like, you know, this deer is aggressive because of trail cameras mm-hmm. or such and such. You've seen him fight before. Um, seen or like up on trail camera, anything, or like you can in, you know, you can read a, if a deer stand out there, you can read his body language of like, and he looks timid. Like I, if I'm going to call it this deer, he's, you know, most likely going to run the other like way. Stifler, Stifler was like a 50, 50, but like. like the deer I killed this year, Raphael, I guarantee that deer was aggressive because we probably over two years of trail cameras, we had probably eight videos of him total and, he was and seven of them were him fighting. So like, we could you, have called him, you know, that deer's by. aggressive just and, by this, by history. And, and but, um, yeah, just being able to read the deer's body language of, I probably shouldn't call to this deer, so I'm not going to. He's or like, by himself. you can tell he's aggressive, and you know it. Like, mm-hmm. you can call him in. That's on sight calling. On blind calling, it's we like to do it. You know, probably more than we should. Fairly, you know, you're there to mix things up, though. Yeah, like, I mean, you guys but, are aggressive, and you're being catalysts. Like, you guys have never been known for not. You know, like you're not fringe hunters. You're no, not hunting the aggressive. edges of properties. You go right in there. Going and I mean, and getting in the, the, the wall, the wall, you know, walls. I mean, it's more than enough, you know, proof is in the pudding. Yeah. You know, in terms of that, I mean, how many bucks have you done this to? I mean, that's just in the last five years that I was counting. That's not even counting the ones you killed before five years ago. So, mm-hmm. I but mean, I think on cool. blind calling, we're doing it a certain time of the day. And we're only doing it, you know, maybe once, we're only maybe rattling twice a, twice a sit, maybe, maybe not even that, maybe once. Um, and it's at certain time of the day, like we're not going to do it. We're, we do it like right before, like good shooting light, but like not so late that deer are already back to bed mm-hmm. and not so early that, you know, if they come in, like it's questionable camera light, like it's got to sure. be good. But then again, they got to like, be up and moving around and start of the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then like blind calling too we're not just straight up immediately beating the horns together you're like we'll work into it because you know you never know there could be a deer 100 yards away in thick timber and you have no idea he's there and you beat them together you're going to scare that deer you know complete other way around Mm -hmm. so we just you know work your way into like you know start tickle and then like you, you click them together pretty hard and then you know depends on how you what time of the year are they super aggressive you know time of the time of the year so you're hitting together and smacking them really good or you're just tinking them together and a lot of times i feel like knowing your properties too is, yeah. a, is a big factor in how you call and how you approach calling a deer um yeah like, there's like like our big place you know we get down in grand central and we rattle and everything within any of the fingers that tie into this big block of timber within 500 yards can hear us because sound just carries down there and you've got other places where you rattle and it's even on a dead quiet day it's only traveling a couple hundred yards because it's so dense there's also farm specific too like we've got a farm that the deer just aren't aggressive and then we've got other farms that are like man you call it these things it doesn't matter any of them could come in because they're all aggressive. Mm-hmm. So 
that's just another way of like farm identification too. Like know your know your form. Sure. And going back on what you're saying about knowing a deer's body language, you could read it as they're coming in or they're in front of you, behind you, wherever they are, or you could run your trail cameras. That's one of the other reasons we run our trail cameras on video mode, not just to support, you know, our video for the show, but also to say, you know, this buck is aggressive. Like you think, he's in a think scrape about, and he's busting the shit out of every you know, branch he can reach. You, you think know? about a deer like Stan, like Stan was an aggressive buck. He came mm-hmm. running in yeah, to the rattle to sequence, 20 or, yards running. Um, you know, other deer kind of sidestep in at you guys or walk into and are more investigative, but Stan was looking for a fight and you guys knew that, you know, before you Mm -hmm. even went into that area. So I think that's another big tip for you guys. If you're, you know, willing to spend a little bit of extra dough on batteries, you could learn a lot about a deer's body Mm -hmm. language by just looking and observing them through that video. Just watch them on camera. I mean, typically, you know, one thing we like to do is, if we see a deer, we've had it a lot, and we've tried it and failed. I mean, there's we're not a 100% success story. Don't, don't get mm-hmm. us wrong. There's been deer that we've tried to call to, and they don't want no freaking part of it. Like, these are deer that are always by themselves on trail camera. They're never too crazy hot in the scrapes. You just usually catch them going through a transition area or what have you. Like, these are deer that are just straight loners. They're not – and to me, they're not the type of deer that – really care to be around any other deer let alone doe let alone does even fade you know? was a little like that fade kind was, of, kind fade of was semi-loner kind of he wasn't an aggressive deer i mean i called it fade several different times and yeah he didn't even turn his head no didn't even want no part of it and he was a deer that was completely running this property and he still didn't even want anything to do with me mm-hmm. and then after after you've had a couple times where you failed at calling at a deer to me that's it like if you've tried a couple times he doesn't want nothing to do with it you're not going to change his mood i mean even if he is by himself out cruising or working a scrape line or something if he doesn't want no part of it not even taking the horns off the branch anymore they're they're just going to sit where they're at because you're just wasting your time that's a good point and so now looking at um specifically sight calling jesse what is the magical distance? And now I know the wind speed, you know, the wind cover, the sound cover is going to indicate how hard you're going to beat the horns. But what's that magical distance? And obviously, like, going back to what Matt said a couple minutes ago about the actual visual breakup of where you're at. So let's say you're in a scenario where you do have the visuals on your side. Like, maybe you're in a little piece of timber like the, where uh, you're like broken up. situation. Mm-hmm what's the distance in which you're like okay this deer is out here i can rattle to him what's the maximum distance like the you're, maximum yeah whether you're or like minimum you're, minimum even i'd say like maximum and minimum. i'd We're say like 200 yards or you know just short of that it's like the sweet spot like you know it's got to be far enough away where they can't look over and be like nothing over there <laughs> there's well, nothing over there well frankie killed that buck yeah but big I, nine years ago I'm and just that deer saying, was like 800 yards away yeah he rattled him in, that's what i'm, you know, I'm just like, saying like that's the like that seems to be where, like, if you think back to all the deer we've rattled at and, and called in, 200 yards seems to be the sweet spot. Like That's that. about all we can see in a lot of places. Right. That we hunt. But, That's fair. but, like, I would say that the Interstate 10, when we first rattled him in and we saw him within 30 seconds, mm-hmm. was, he was a he couple was, hundred yards away. Yeah, he was, like, 100, 150, probably. I mean, just, just going off of how quickly he showed up. Mm-hmm. But, like... Every buck that we rattled in in the past year, the Interstate, not the Interstate 10, Potential and Rob, they were like all around 200 yards when we first called to them and like they come right 90 in. seconds. Yeah, they were there. Yeah, closing ground fast. So what do you think, Jesse, is the distance where you're like, no way, this deer's too close, I'm not rattling at this deer. I'm not, not doing it. Like not rattling, probably a hundred, like n- anything over a hundred or even a little bit, like maybe 150, I'm not going to rattle at. Just because, unless... That's goes. That's sight calling. If you don't know yeah, the deer's calling, there, yeah. I'd say 100, 125. Because like at that point, he's either so close he can see you, or you know you can grunt at him. Which we and did it with Stifler. We we sight called at him. Yeah, that's true. And he was close. I mean, we, if anybody that's followed the show for very long, we sight called at Stifler two different times, and he came in and committed two different times. Yeah, we mm-hmm. we didn't come to fruition and end up killing him, but. We sight called at him twice, and he came within thirty yards. That's of the something to be said times. too. Is like, that's where we've had good luck. Is like that deer got by us, and he passed us, and, and he got passed clear us. Out of eyesight. We let him get clear out of eyesight. I picked up the horns and just clinked them together two times for like maybe three seconds, like tink tink, tink tink, 
and like set them down and like that's like candy in front of a baby because like if you could just tickle them and they're like hey wait a minute what's going i didn't see you over there we did that with stifler and we did that with another buck i can't remember which one it was oh jesus and they need to think about and it's like they they can't take it they have to come back and check it in it's I almost did. like a pride thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Like if yeah. you if your wife is like, "You forgot to leave the door open," oh, or something. No, it was like, the Interstate Ten buck. Oh, come in. Didn't I didn't leave the door it, open. Went honey, in there blah, blah, and you blah. ticked him together for like three seconds, and he was out. And that deer's like, "Hey, you son of a bitch! Where'd you come from?" Right. You know, exactly. like, hey, uh, I just went by here, but I didn't see anything. But something's out there, and it sounds pretty good. I need to go check it out again. And that deer was in front of us at ten. You're yards. within that threatening bubble where yeah. he's like, uh, "Okay, that's kind of in my that's in my neighborhood." Right now, approaching my back door. I need to go look out the window and see what, see mm-hmm. what's going on. So, um, Matt, when you are thinking about sight calling a deer, um, would you agree with Jesse? Yeah. That about 100 yards, yeah. 120 yards is like, at this point, I, I think I'm too, not going to rattle I think, it too, the, the distance changes with what type of call you're going to use. Yeah. As far as rattling goes, if, if I'm, I'm not going to... 90% of the time, I'm not going to rattle at a deer that's inside of 150 yards sight calling. Now, I can grunt at a deer that's 80 yards away through the timber, just a light, soft grunt, sight calling at him, and, and be comfortable doing that. Or snort wheeze. I'm not going to snort wheeze at a deer that's right on top of me no. either. It's all, it's all perspective, too, because like we could tickle the horns at 150 and you know convince them, but we're not going to beat them to death. No. Mm-hmm. So it's all like you don't want to bring his eardrums. Very yeah. situational. If, yeah, if you like 125, 150, and you beat them to you beat them together hard, they're like see a flag. That ain't right. They're gone. Sure. Um, speaking about the difference in the you know the deer coming and kind of popping that 100, 120 yard bubble. Um, before we hop into grunting, how do you guys do it? So if you just would like to just go or just display or. Tell the listeners if, if they're close. It's, when you were doing a rattling sequence, let's say you're doing a blind rattling sequence, Matt. How mm-hmm. long does it last, and what does it sound like? Go ahead and describe it. Well, if I'm doing a blind rattling sequence, obviously I don't know where where the fuck he's at. Right. Yep. Um. So I typically I like to get that first big initial clack, and I'll let that ring out for three to five seconds, typically. Let that be your attention getter. Let that be your your hook, I guess, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. And then I'll slowly go click, 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 click. You know, and you, you have to pause. You can't just keep banging them together because if you're banging them together the whole time, you can't hear what could be coming. And there is times to to your guys's point here, like where deer are on you in seconds. Yes. You know, and that's happened with Garrett and I before as well, where we rattle and it's within ten to twenty seconds that a bup will pop out and show himself. And I feel like that you know, pause actually helps you in the long that's run. That's a great point. Because if a deer comes great running point. in and you're just going yeah. with the antlers, he's going to be like, I don't yeah. see nobody. But if you're pausing every five to seven seconds, you're going to catch him more than likely coming in in between your pauses. And if you're in a timber set, and then you can be like through the leaves and things like that. And too. you can, you can hear him coming. You can maybe even see him coming. And then you have time to put your shit away. Yeah. yeah yeah so if you're yep. pausing routinely you know between that five to seven second range you're gonna have time to drop your shit because i've had to do that before like oh fuck here he comes throw sure. the horns out of the way and get ready and you just i feel like you set yourself up for more success by pausing every five to seven seconds at max like you're not and how long are you gonna let that ride for so there's been times where i've rattled for a minute you know, and I've seen guys on TV rattle for two to three minutes. Like those guys that are down in Texas, just out there literally trying to rattle deer in and they're just banging them together and trying to rifle shoot a deer in Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But for me, where we hunt at, you know, if those deer are anywhere in most of our farms, that 60 second time frame is going to be probably about the max that I'm going to hit them together. And any longer than that, you know, most buck fights you see last could be that boom and they're done or it could be you know 30 to 45 seconds and they're pretty much over it you know Mm -hmm. i've very rarely seen in my 20 years of being in the timber a buck fight last longer than a minute sure how about you jesse what's the uh what's the standard procedure like you pick up your antlers what are you gonna do so 
And Matt, we're talking about blind. Right. Matt and I hunt together. So obviously we do a lot of the same things. I'm in the same way. Click, you know, let them sit. And then we'll, I'll hit, hit them together because we use like, and then I like to also like kind of grind them together. Not necessarily like, but like, like those hard clacks. Ma- make, make the noise of like, okay, there's, these things are rubbing together. They're locked. And mm-hmm. because like you have to make this lifelike if you want to be successful in calling. So like sometimes I even like close my eyes to like think of a buck fight and like what it would sound like if I was listening to one like happening in front of me or like a buck fight on YouTube or something of like, I need to recreate this to make it sound perfect. So like click them together, not going to beat them to death for, you know, 15 seconds in a row because that's not going to happen, but I'll rub them together and like grind the antlers you know, make some more noise than just clickety, clickety, click, click, and then wait and more clickety, clickety, click. So it just, that's what I like to do. I think the occasional tine clink here yeah. and there makes a big yeah. difference. Like the tips of the tines going tink, clink, clink. I think that's, mm-hmm. that's a, a big, a big thing I like to do too. Sometimes like you're, you'll hit that clack and then they'll, it just can't be the same tone over and over and over. No, it's not. gotta be different. I just thought of a good analogy. You guys ever played that little game when you were a kid called Rock'em Sock'em Robots, Robots where yeah. you got those two little controls. One's the left punch, one's the right punch, and you and your buddy, you just go and you click the left and the right mm-hmm. as quickly as you can and try to get the little head to pop up of the other guys, the mm-hmm. opponent. That would be kind of the equivalent of not grinding them together, not stopping and pausing, you know, yes. things like that. It's like to conceive that a deer is just going with his foe that he's trying to take down is almost like two deer are set up about a yard away from each other and they're like banging their antlers and that's not a thing that deer do so i like the point that you said it it grinding i listened to clark talk about this before and it's almost like he's like at this point the deer's antlers are locked and the deer are pushing one another around um, and like you said, that grinding is happening. So it's not all just no. It's different tones. And like Matt said, like move move on the tine. So like it's the tone is different. Like the end is a, you know a mm-hmm. you higher tone, and then you get lighter down clink. closer to the base. It's more deep and throatier. Yeah, I agree with that. A hundred percent. Great points. A hundred. Just you guys just knocked that question out of the damn park. Um, my next question, though, let's settle the debate. Jesse, we'll kick it over to you first. What size of antler and what type of antler? For example, 6.8 point, 10 point, 12 point, age of deer, if you want to think about that or if you want to give a mass measurement. What's your ideal rattle antler size and setup? Like Matt mentioned earlier, he likes to mismatch them, but what's yours? Um, again, Matt and I hunt together, so we, we use, use the same, use the same horns. horns. <laughs> and, and the, but... Um, like a three-year-old, hundred and twenty like inch deer, thirty, nothing in bigger than one thirty, hundred and twenty, hundred and twenty-five inch deer with some decent mass. And I want to ask you why, because I feel like the answer is going to be very important for people that are considering picking out their ant- rattle antlers. Well, you don't want to go in there with an eighty-inch set. We don't want to go in there and rattle with wider. You're not. You're not going to call in very big deer, but you're also not going to want to go in there with a hundred and sixty-inch set either, because they're going to sound like you're tearing the woods down. So, like, you're trying to kill. Right. My thought process is you want to use like a three-year-old 125-inch deer with decent mass so they'll carry, the sound will carry, but at mm-hmm. the same time, it's not so aggressive that you can't call in mature deer, mm-hmm. but it's not so light that you can't hear anything and all you're going to call in is two- and three-year-olds. Because obviously, a buck, a, a mature deer really doesn't probably care about a year and a half old two and a half year old buck sparring when he hears that so like like, mm -hmm. it's gonna have to be significant sized enough to like eh, let's go check it out Mm -hmm. but at the same time not so aggressive to like man i do not want to mess with that dude so all good points so to put it into the listener's perspective our set of horns we have we have a four point side and a five point side obviously both are the brow tines are cut off well our four point side is like 120 inch eight. So it's a decent size four point side. It's got heavier mass and shorter tine length than our five point side. Our five point side's like a medium size mass, but longer tine length. And it just gives that illusion of two different size caliber bucks. One's heavier, one's more long and skinny. It just, to me, it, I don't know, maybe it, maybe I'm crazy for thinking that, but it just, it, it sounds more realistic than taking a There's deer's two match different set tones. Yeah, yeah that's a great point 
That's a great point. You guys should let us know what you're thinking about this too, because I feel like Matt just brought up a really good point, leveraging all the things that Jesse just said. He basically you're saying if you pick up a match set, which to your point, my rattle antlers that Garrett and I use that we picked up like three or four years ago, it is a match set. And I totally mm-hmm. know what you mean by that. Like you're saying, I'm going to pick this side off of a deer and this side off a deer, mm-hmm. a right and a left, but I'm going to mismatch them so that it does sound like, all right, this is a little deeper thud of a noise. This is a more hollow kind of uh, higher pitched and kind of piercing sound to mm-hmm. this particular antler. Is that what you're mm-hmm. saying essentially? Yeah. yeah. That's a great point too. Um, what about uh, the the number? Because I I feel like when I use a eight point set of antlers to rattle with, I'm not getting enough of that interlock that I'm seeking four. to get. I really really like rattling with the main point, you know, mainframe ten point. A four um, and a five point side, you my... can actually get the tines to lock in. You know, I thought I, thought I had to turn this mic off for a second, but we're good. I was just the bottom thing, but well, a four good. and a five point side is what we like to use. We're not going to go any crazier than that. We're not going to use a six by five, you know, or six by six to. Right. More than likely, those are trophy sheds anyway that are going to sit on the shelf at home. Right. So we're not yep. going to be out there raking the woods down with. <laughs> an eight, an eight by six, or something <laughs> right. stupid. That's yeah. not. We're going with your hundred and twenty inch, you know, three year old eight with your hundred and thirty inch three year old ten pointer going out there, getting after it. You know, that's, I like what Jesse said too. You don't want to pick antlers that are so large yeah, that gonna. they're too threatening, but you don't want to pick antlers that are so small that it's like a big deer's like, ah, those are just two dinks yeah. sparring. Yeah, in yeah you don't want to bang like two four by fours together it's in the woods. Just, just and enough. Like, Fuck you! Right, I ain't going right, right, over right. there. Just enough to be like, man. Even if you are trying to, to rattle I in a two hundred inch deer, out. he's not going to be like. You're banging two sledgehammers together. No. He's going to be like, yeah, fuck you. I'm not going over <laughs> yeah, there. Right? No. I'm not going to nope. break this pretty rack up. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of rattling. Um, and now we're getting into deer vocalization. So let's start with the most popular one, um, which would be a grunt. Yeah. Um, so Matt, we'll kick this one over to you mm. first. Um, what's a scenario in which you're like, okay, grunt time. Here we go. I'm doing it. Go ahead. It's not going to be a more often times than not. It's not going to be blind. It's going to be it's going really to be a sight calling kind of deal to me. I mean to us, we're together all the fucking time, so it's going to be a sight calling kind of deal. It's going to be a deer that is either cruising, working a scrape line. You know, those are going to be the one two kind of deal. It's a, mm-hmm. yeah. he's out he's out looking. You know, he could you know. You grunt, make a simulate, simulate like you're a buck ten in a doe, and he's like, Whoo, "Wait a minute, what's going on over here?" Or you've got a deer that's you know showing dominance, showing territorial display at a scrape, and you're like, "You'll throw him a couple," burp, burp, you know. That second one, you typically be just a little bit longer to kind of, if you don't get his attention on the first initial grunt, mm-hmm. kind of make it sound like a, a, a lighter. Jesse does it a lot. The lighter lighter growl roar kind of deal and you know typically they'll they'll give you a look or you know they'll turn their ears and listen but that's it's never never going to be a blind kind of deal for me unless i'm doing a blind rattling sequence then i might start it off with a couple grunts or something but so let's say that jesse a deer is at like that 120 125 yard buffer you were talking about earlier is that a situation where you're like okay I'm going to grunt now. And if you grunt at the deer, obviously you're going to take the body language into consideration and where you are into consideration, but take us through a grunt sequence for that deer and how you're going to bring him in. So uh, let's just say that it's just a deer that you want to call and call in and try and kill and get his attention or whatever. I'll start out with just a breath and I pay, you know, if he doesn't hear me do a little louder. And then if he doesn't hear me again, I'll, you know, I'll, get after it a little bit more and then if he still doesn't hear me that's when i'll get the antlers together and just tink him in a little bit or i'll just be like i'll just nope. wait and see what he does sure but if he hears me on that first one i'll usually throw him you know one or two and then he see you know read his language from there mm-hmm. and a lot of times it'll be like they just come in or whatever but it's just more of like a hey what's up type of thing you know it's that's the grunting is the like the least aggressive thing you can do it's like a turkey yelp you know and then what you could sit you know and then you go on turkey yelp and then like a cut could be a rattle sequence and you got your snort wheeze could be something else like a fighting purr right Mm -hmm. so like you just work your way in easy and then 
if if you need to go more aggressive, that's when you go more aggressive. But yeah, just one or two and then go from there. Potential is a great example. I mean, he really is. The first encounter we had with him, you were hunting. We were late. We, we were I just late. watched that episode yesterday on YouTube. We were late. He We rattled and we grunted. I don't think we did a snort wheeze. But he snort wheezed at the he bottom of the tree. was at the bottom of the damn tree just across the fence and 25 yards away, and we didn't even know he was there. And it was one of the things where he came, you know, what was it, probably 10 minutes after we called. Yeah, it was a long time. Because he disappeared out in the brush, and we called, and it was like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. I know you want to hold my hand. <laughs> no, that's okay. It was like 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden, he snort yeah. wheezes at the bottom of our damn tree. Yeah. <laughs> we did that this year, too. With yeah, with the, Rob. No. No. The... Uh, uh, the so pretty deer. ten pointer. Yeah, so many he was. We don't even pay attention. <laughs> he was at the bottom of the tree. Yeah, <laughs> old but, skinny. Yeah, skinny's what we named him. Old but, skinny. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. Rest in peace. <laughs> yeah. Um, talking about grunts now. Rattling is a little bit. Uh, there's there's not a whole ton of variation you could do with it, and you could take my words out of context when I just say, and you could say, yeah, there's a lot of sounds you can make with rattle. Yes, I know that. I'm well aware of that. But I'm talking the purpose of a grunt can be done in many different ways. For example, um, when Garrett and I are n- not calling and we're just kind of trying to um, mix it up and we're not trying to simulate a fight sequence, we'll give some like, you know, we've all had just it happen where you've got grunts. that two or three-year-old buck that's running a doe around your tree and stuff like that you know (laughs) um you know last year when we were hunting mocha you know Mm -hmm. that two-year-old he came busting through there on that hot dog just just like more of a tending grunt where you guys are talking about when you're getting aggressive a more of like a throaty like yeah but like a, and a gr- more you like, don't hear a lot of the deep yeah. groaning grunts. Not it's it's very rare, but I you you will hear them in the oh, right yeah, but situation. I'll Say you've f- got a, a big buck and he's trying to keep everybody away from his doe. He's gonna let everybody oh, know, like sure, get the fuck away from her, like right I'll, now. You know? I'll never forget that day we were in the pasture and that and we two were year old si- did that. We were just shit. sitting there and we heard this. I mean, I've never heard it before. It was like a growl, and I'm like. <laughs> I was like, filming. I'm, I'm was get that? your bow because whatever is making this noise is big. And right. he come running in, growling, and I'm like, yeah, "This thing's a two and a half year old." But they do make different noises. But like, yeah. there's you, know, you got your light just bit, and then you got your, or you'll have that. And then you've got the breeding make. grunt, which is like a longer, like, drawn out grunt. Like they're doing that popping, like ten yeah. or fifteen, like maybe five, ten, fifteen seconds long. Sure. Um, so talking about that at, at what point, cause I think the, the grunt is kind of a really nice in between, so right? It's the distance in between where you're like, I've rattled at a deer. He's far away. He's breaking. Now he's at a hundred ish yards. Now I'm going to grunt at him. At what point do you think a deer is, a deer is too close to grunt at? Cause Garrett and I called the deer in, unfortunately, I hit the deer high in the shoulder, didn't end up finding him. Um, got pictures of him, so luckily he lived. But he was about 20 yards away and kind of staring, facing a different direction. And Garrett threw a really soft, quick grunt at him, and he came whirling around, trotted in actually on us. And what do you guys think is that area where you're like, eh, this deer's potentially too close. And I know that all these questions that we're asking and talking about here today are so highly subjective and so highly situational that it's hard to pin down an answer. But what do you, what's the distance on you guys when you're like, I'm uncomfortable grunting at this deer. Like, this is too close, Jesse. Um, if he's, I, I don't have a, a really a range. It all depends on if he can see the bottom of the tree or not. Because mm-hmm. if he can see the bottom of the tree, there's no sense in calling at him. But, if he's good rule if he's thirty yards away, but you've got good cover in between you and him, you got a bunch of honeysuckle and shit can, in the way. You, you know. can and you don't roar at him real loud. You can light ground at him, and most of the you know you could probably get him to come in, or at least at least work to a shooting lane. Because if he's thirty yards, he's in shooting range, mm-hmm. but he might right, be behind right, right. something. You grunt at him, and he might you know try and maybe work try and get downwind of you or something. Work to a shooting lane, you got him. One thing sure. we're not gonna do is I'm not gonna go. But and yeah, right at yeah, him. I'm gonna turn my head. Yeah, and you'll 
directionally deter the audio somewhere else directionally not look right at him and grunt yeah, at him that's He's a no-no like, huh? yeah what the heck's going on sure i we never grunt right at a dude no, i don't, don't care how close he is no direct you got to change the direction especially if he's facing if he's facing away that might be a little different story you can but if he's angling at you one different direction or another even kind of come if he's coming our direction i'm not going to call to him no. he's already headed mm-hmm. your way he's but if, he, yeah. if he's angling you know kind of deter it I, tr- I would like to try to deter it behind him so it might cause him to want to circle around downwind of what he's already heard and then he'll come and cut the distance between you and where you threw your call at that's thinking. a good point and i i feel like for those of you guys that are wondering what the two of them just described and what they're talking about here they're saying there's a deer he's within you know a, a he's he's tight to the tree he's it, he is close they're saying don't point the noise, but don't point the end, like the barrel, as funny as it is called that, of your grunt tube directly at the deer. Throw it off to the side. And lots of you guys have seen this done on, like, the Outdoor mm-hmm. Channel or maybe on YouTube. Um, lots of grunt tubes have that flexible mm-hmm. hose at the end that kind of deepen the sound of that particular grunt or call. And that's what they're talking about. They're just saying if you've got a deer at your 12 o'clock, let's point it out to, like, 9 o'clock or, or even back, six. In, back towards 6 o'clock. So that way the deer is not, he's more puzzled and he's going to have to investigate a little bit more Mm -hmm. to actually locate where the grunt came from because it wasn't so directionally in his face. So we've done that with rattling too. I mean, if you've got a deer you're sight calling to, you're not going to sit there and point your horns at him where he can see you banging him around in the Mm -hmm. tree. You're going to turn around. Kind of conceal him. You're going to turn, you're going to hide. You don't want him to see that movement of the tree, especially during November. You don't have any leaves or anything to break you up. Another excellent point. Um, Going into a lesser used vocalization here now. um, And great answers, great responses to all this. This is going really well. Lots of good information in this one. So, doe bleats. Um, you know, that's, that's one of those things that I used when I was, you know, just started out hunting. We had, you know, those primos can, can, can. you had the mini can, you had the original, the baby buck on it, the long can, um, and each one of them was just kind of a different, (laughs) each one of them was just, (laughs) you know, a different depth and, uh, time duration of, Mm -hmm. you know, a doe bleat. So you are a hard no. I'm not. I wouldn't say a hard no, but it's just not something that I'm gonna typically do. Not something you typically do. How about you, Jesse? I was, I was just talking to one of my buddies the other day, and I told him I told him what we were podcasting about, and I said I was gonna bring up the can call. That's what I killed my first buck off of in shotgun season. Yep. I I can called while the guy I was with because I was young enough to where I didn't need to be out by myself. Yeah, so you're twelve. Yeah. He brought out a can <laughs> call. We can call and come right in, but. And I, I've tried to use it since, and honestly, I, I don't use it at all now. And there's nothing wrong with them. They are effective at certain times in the year, mm-hmm. but it's just not something that... And we've heard of bleat, you know, yeah, it's yeah. not very often. Yeah, you don't really yeah. hear them all that often. And we're out in the... We hear grunting, snort wheezing, and, you know, fighting much... Not necessarily fighting, but grunting and snort wheezing much more than we hear doe bleeds. I would agree with that, too. I mean, the scenario in which we hear a doe bleat the most Fairies. often is like when a fawn is lost mm-hmm. yeah uh, trying to locate her mother or a yearling yep. is trying to locate maybe the other yearling that he came to the food plot with that's the kind of scenario when i hear a bleat the most often but i rarely in like a rut scenario when no. we're trying to take down a big buck or in late october that, where we're after a big that one that breeding bellow yeah, that I, call I, is, I rarely that call that. is the last on the totem pole right 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 but there is a call that is above it, and I kind of went out of order here, but I wanted to save the best for last because you guys have done this successfully a couple times, and this is the no nuts left, all marbles, all dollars on the table, the complete last-ditch effort call, but you guys have done it, and you guys have killed several giant deer doing it. Um, so let's talk about the snort wheeze. So, um, Jesse, what's the scenario in which you are going to snort wheeze at a buck? last ditch effort type of thing where you know like i'm i've tried the other two things and we're just going to give this a go or that you know that the deer is really aggressive so like i'll be honest that's how i killed brody it was getting closer to end of shooting light in the timber Mm -hmm. so and i saw him come or i saw him standing there so i honestly had my book bag packed up 
I didn't I had my grump call put away. I just used my mouth and and he looked and he started coming and I'm like, okay, here we go. So like last ditch effort, like I need to make something happen. I've got this much time left or the other two things didn't work. This is the most aggressive thing you can use. You're slapping your That's dick it. out on the table yeah. is what you're doing. L- here we go. And so there you have it. You've got a mainframe 10 point, uh, about 175. That's dear Jesse calls Brody. And then you guys also did that with, uh oh, another, <laughs> not just big deer, but another huge deer. Um, so whole different situation, whole mm-hmm. different situation. So Matt, what's the scenario in which you're like, now it's time kind of more of that last ditch effort, but what are some things that you're thinking going through in your mind when you're about to snort wheeze at a deer that the listeners should know about? So with, uh, Oh, it was December 9th. I'm pretty sure December 9th, it was muzzle litter season. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're at, we're on that tail end. The ruts pretty much came and gone and there's a few does you know, trickling into heat that might've not got bred the first time around. And we were on a spot where we had a big wide open field in front of us. I mean, you guys have all seen it. If you follow us enough, we're not rattling at that deer. We didn't even have the horns with us. Like after first gun season, our, our horns usually don't even come with us anymore. Right. Um, same with Garrett and I, uh, Oh, was out in this field, bumping does grunting, showing dominance, showing a territorial display of, Hey, I'm the top son of a bitch out here in this field. All right, these little yeah. bucks were getting mm-hmm. out of his way. Mm-hmm. Nope. And we knew there were other nice deer in the area. So I was just like, I don't know even what went on in my head. I'm like, you know what, you son of a bitch? I'm going to snort wheeze at you. Yeah. And Jesse said it. The guy just turned inside out. He I did. mean, he freaking, he was like, huh? Who yeah. the hell? Usually, I mean, we've all tried and, and it was a we've, side call. We've all failed, but. Normally, you cannot call deer off does. Correct. But, and boy, it, he did. Well, I mean, he probably, I mean, he, he course, came there was, 200 yards. There was a lot of deer in the field. I mean, he was probably bumping three or four, but there was more deer than that in the field. Mm-hmm. And old boy left his girls and was coming. Yeah. Immediately. I mean, immediately. Immediately dropped what he's doing and made your way up there. So, But, like, that's the perfect. We failed, we I were, would say, 75% of the time when it comes to the snort wheeze. We were far off enough to, like, he couldn't really see what was going on, but he could hear it, and he knew that, like, it was the perfect call to use because, like, you can, like, I'm trying to get these does, and then now somebody's coming in to get my does. Like, Mind you, we were sitting on a scrape line in the fence row, too, so that could have been a factor. He knew that scrape line was there. Yeah. He could have thought, okay, there's a buck over Logically, here. Logically, it's making sense to him. Yeah. Yeah. There's a scrape literally right behind us. There's a scrape, and we've had pictures of a giant using that scrape within the same week. Yep. So he could have thought, oh, all right, okay. We're going to do this right now, huh? So actually physically making the sound, I kind of do it through my through my teeth and just slightly with my lips. But, Matt, you want to back the microphone off of your face really quick and just – kind of emulate what you're talking about, like your last ditch dis- effort snort wheeze for sure. the listeners? And I typically, you know, with a lot of these calls that they have for a snort wheeze anymore, there is some kind of tube mm-hmm. that you're going to be using, but I will always typically cut my hand. It's almost like air yeah. being rapidly let I, out of like a blow-up. You got to get a good up. amount of slobber coming yeah, out of your s- mouth, too. Yeah, it can't be dry. I mean, it's a messy job to snort wheeze, but you got to get a little bit of slobber brewed in there to get that actual... Because it's coming out of a deer's nose. Mm-hmm. When they're snort wheezing, it's coming out of their nose. So they're blowing snot out. Yep. That's good to, that's good to mention, too. So you you want to get some of that of moisture a, sound to it. It's more... It's, it's almost like a hiss. I don't want to call mm-hmm. it necessarily a hiss, but like when I do it, it's more of the tss, tss, tss. Like I'm saying T S T S Yeah. And I'm just pushing that air out rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um and that's how, you know, that's how we killed K two last year was, you know, we saw him, he went down into some cover. Mm-hmm. We immediately did a light, you know, did a light rattling sequence. Garrett snort wheezed at him and he, he was in the decoy within, you know, sixty five, seventy seconds of the time we saw him. So it can be an effective call. It is a you gotta engage your diaphragm if you're gonna do it with your mouth. It is a balls to the walls call. It's more of a last ditch effort. I wouldn't recommend snort wheezing at a deer that's like inside of, you know, I don't know, inside of sixty or eighty yards. No, probably no. scare the shit out of them. Um 
but it, it can be effective though. Very. So we've basically covered, you know, the four or five main types of calls that can be used. And we've talked about it, um, the scenarios, the distances, the cadences and things like that. So let's get into your favorite past experiences with aggressively calling. So Matt, you can go ahead and take that one first, your favorite experience. And I know that there's been a ton of them. And like we mentioned at the beginning of you guys have, I mean, realistically, if I went back and counted all the deer you guys have ever killed, you guys have probably combined to kill about 20 bucks uh, with some sort of calling, whether it be rattle, grunt, snort, wheeze. Yeah, wow. So what's your number one favorite past experience with aggressively calling, Matt? I mean, you've got a oh at the top of the top of the charts, and then you've got, I mean, phew. I know mine. That was just, I mean, Brody. I mean, shit. well, that's not mine, but I'm saying, like, yeah, that Brody is my, was a because he's my biggest deer. And most, but the right. most aggressively I think I've ever called it a deer would be either Stan or the Interstate Ten. I mean, I Interstate, Interstate Ten, we let her rip. Interstate Ten is my favorite because there's a certain reason why we were hunting on the complete opposite of the interstate because he was over there. Mm-hmm. We pulled the card after we got done hunting and we saw he went west. So we're like, okay, we know where we need to be. So that was when we coined the hole. We found the <laughs> hole and sat in it. We knew he was west. We rattled. We got in there. And Matt literally said on the interview, we're going to let things settle hour. down. We're going to let things settle down for about five minutes. And we had just gotten there. We set up, let things settle down for about five minutes, and we rattled. And that deer was in our faces in less than 60 seconds. We called, and he looked, didn't see anything, and he went in the timber, and Matt clicked them together, and snort, I think he snort wheezed, mm-hmm. and that buck came running out and running down the hill. Ears laid back. And was ticked off and standing in front of us at, like, 10 yards, and we're standing on the ground. So, like, this, like we used our trail cameras to, like, okay, this deer went west. We know that's where he is, so we followed him, and then we called him in twice. And, you know, you guys were smart about it, too, because, I mean, the, the place that you're talking about, you know, the three of us know the outlay of it pretty well. There's really only one way for a deer to travel through that place. East and west. Mm-hmm. You know, it's east and west, and it is a, it, there's not very much timber there. It's a very Ooh. overlooked spot, and you guys have pounded a lot of big deer out there, just like another particular place that you guys hunt. I um, feel like you guys are like the kings of overlooked spots, in my opinion. Lots of, like, farms that somebody would be like, nah, I don't want to hunt there. You guys go and pull giants out of every year. But um, the Interstate 10 was interesting to me, like as a viewer and a person that wasn't YouTube, because um, you you did, like we talked about earlier, you had the opportunity to call it the deer twice. You called at him. He went into the timber, I believe, to investigate the call. <clears throat> it realized there, I don't, there's nothing in here because it is a small chunk of timber that he went into. Then knowing like situationally like this deer can't see me right now i have the aid of cover i'm gonna do it again now he really pinpoints and comes all the way to 10 yards so like you just read him like a book like he lots of times you know when you watch an outdoor tv episode or something a guy will blind rattle and then a deer will come wheeling through their shooting line but i think what killed that deer was you two just reading him like a book like he he read your script because you read him read him the right way and, and that's what i thought that was really really cool about mm-hmm. the interstate 10 um so those are you know just a couple experiences we could sit here for hours and talk about this all day but let's get into some would you rather so would you jesse you can go first use a grunt tube or rattle antlers you can only bring one to the deer stand what are you going with rattle matt rattle Okay. I'd I can, say, I can simulate too. a grunt with my mouth halfway decent, so I'll be all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jesse, would you rather use a buck growl or, you know, grunt or a snort wheeze? You can only use one. Uh, snort wheeze because uh, I really don't know why, but I we have found it to be more uh, effective than the grunt. Sure. Matt? I'm the same. Also going with the snort wheeze. Okay. Uh, next question, Jesse. 10-point mainframe rattle antlers or 8-point mainframe? You can't go 5 and 4 like you guys talked about earlier. It's got to be one or the other. 10-point rattle antlers. Matt? 10. Cool Ranch or Nacho Cheese Doritos, Jesse? Cool Ranch. 
cool spicy ranch. nacho. Can I do spicy yeah, nacho? Do that. Cool That's ranch not part is of the goat. hypothetical. It's yeah, okay, cool ranch it's going to have cheese. to be a cool ranch. It's it's either cool ranch or spicy nacho. You like nacho cheese is just a garbage ass flavor. If you're gonna <laughs> no, say, shut if up. you're gonna have na- if you're gonna have na- <laughs> flavor, if you're gonna have nacho cheese, you might as well step it up a notch and add some spice oh, to that shit. You know, bullshitter. Cool ranch is the goat. You okay? Next time I order a taco pizza, I'm gonna be like, nah. Spicy. I'll be that's like, weird. you can eat that garbage ass shit. Chips off it. Uh, all right. Uh, last question. Uh, the most important, probably, uh, the favorite Taco Bell item that you have off of the menu at Taco Bell, Jesse. Uh, I mean, I'm going to go. There's so many. There is. But, uh, oh, good. it's all delicious. Mm, they usually take the good ones off, which really pisses me off. But I like the, just the standard chalupa right now. It's the go standard chalupa. Matt? I don't even shop at Taco Bell. So. Shop? That was weird what you just said. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't go to Taco Bell. If I'm going to go to a fast food place, I'm going to Wendy's and I'm getting a triple Baconator. You obviously have never been to a fine dining establishment then, so I think this it's, is about time to it's end original, this podcast yeah. because you can't trust Matt because he doesn't like Taco it's Bell. It's authentic. Anybody that doesn't like Taco Bell. Taco Bell's authentic, authentic Mexican. <laughs> yeah. Air quotes authentic. <laughs> oh, God. Air quotes uh, Mexican. Yep. I mean, I ate at Taco Bell one time and I had those cinnamon things they had. That was pretty good. Well, yeah. remember when we... Oh, no. We went to Wendy's on our way to Kansas. Yeah. Yeah, Wendy's is good. You were bitching about not having a Taco Bell, and I we passed like four. Bell. That's my top fast food restaurant. Wendy's. Yeah, what's Bell. yours? What's your favorite? Oh, uh, nah, it's hard to pin- pick what just one. I know. That's well, when he went to Wendy's, he ordered half the menu. The, menu. the quesarito. The quesarito is super it is solid. A, you know, it's it a can't is miss. a chicken burrito with sauce and yeah, rice it's... in it, and it is wrapped in a quesadilla, and it is so good. It the is good. pickle of it is, though. The Taco Bell just recently dropped the quesarito off the menu and put it only on the mobile app. So you can only order it mobily. So they're trying really? to get all these users that See, love the quesarito that. to go on the mobile app. And I just refuse to do it. So essentially, what I'll try to do when I go and pull up their Taco Bell, I'll try to shake down the high school kid or whoever's ever working <laughs> there. Like, hey, can you get a quesarito? Like, I'll play stupid. Like, meh. They'll be like, well, sir, technically you have to order through the mobile app. I'm like, oh, when did that happen? And they were like, uh, a couple years ago. And I'm just like, oh, damn, you can't make an exception just this one time <laughs> again. <laughs> That's how I, I felt just, the other day when I went I'll to Dairy Queen. Guilt, I'll just kind of guilt trip the kid into they giving me a quesarito. They always take the stuff off the menu. Oh, it's so damn good. I went I to Dairy Queen the other day and wanted a snickerdoodle cookie dough blizzard. Come what? to find out, they took the son of a bitch off the menu till the fall. <sighs> God That's, dang it. That's a heartbreaker. Top tier, top tier blizzard. All right. Well, that kind of wraps us up and brings us to the end here. We are encroaching on one hour and we just brought a bunch of really good whitetail knowledge to you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed listening to this podcast about rattling, aggressively calling in general with Matt and Jesse. Jesse, anything for the good of the cause before we get off here that you like to say or leave with the listeners? Uh, just the one thing I can say is to get your launch party tickets soon because we're having a hell of a party and tickets <laughs> are going fast. So if you uh, haven't got to the six six locations, get to them or get a hold of the one of eight of us and we will get you tickets. Okay. We don't want to hear any him hawing around. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. If you If you have to think about it more than once, we don't want you there. Yeah. If you don't like free beer, free gear, deer hunting, and uh, an all-out hanging out with a bunch of crazy ass people, people, then yeah, I guess it's not for you. But yeah. until then, um, shoot, that's pretty shoot much straight. It. Shoot, shoot, <laughs> shoot straight, and don't waste it. <laughs> what do you think? Shoot straight, Jesse. God, I hate that phrase. <laughs>